everybody after me. This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. You may be seated. Amen. Um, my topic tonight is lighten up, God's not dead. And uh, first off, I, w- I want to um, uh, show a little um, video. And I hope you get some, I hope you find some humor in this. I know I did. I love, I love church so much. I mean, it, you know, we've got three kids, so it's got what I'm looking for, you know? Free child care. <laughs> that is such a blessing from God. It is, isn't it? I mean, we, I can hand my screaming child over to, and at my church, it's a volunteer. <laughs> Somebody volunteers to watch screaming children. Man, I have no idea what kind of sin she has committed. <laughs> And in my church, it, we have a system where you hand your kid over, and then they give you a, a number, a little number on a piece of paper. So you hand the kid over, and you get a receipt for the kid, and, um, which I'm against for many reasons. One, the first time they did it, they handed me the receipt, and I was like, what is this? And they're like, you can't uh, get your kid unless you have that number. And I was like, well, good. I got a shredder. Keep him. <laughs> But they're serious about it. If you, you hand your kid over, and then if your kid is bad, the number will pop up on the video screen in the auditorium, and you're supposed to get him. Well, here's my other problem with that. I'm against that because I'm a Christian, and that is gambling, because you're betting against your number, are you not? <laughs> I didn't even know what happened the first time. I sat down, the number instantly popped up. I was like, bingo. <laughs> Here's my other problem with that. My wife and I, we ignore the number. Every Sunday, we ignore the number. Number pops up, we're like, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. We're not gonna go get him, why do you think we're here? (laughs) But we do. It was funny, one time the the volunteer even came in looking for us, trying to find us, like she was gonna be able to spot us with our wig and glasses on. I was home last Sunday. It was funny. I handed my kid over and they gave me the number. I was like, here you go. And she was like, no. Here here you go. You you know how this works by now. This is your son's number. If you see his number come on the screen, if you see 666... See? Uh, some of you may not see the humor in that, but I had four kids raised in churches. That was me right there. The number goes up. It's usually my wife in the nursery calling me to come to the, to the thing. But I hope you got a little bit of humor out of that. Smiling is contagious. Smiling lowers stress and anxiety. Smiling releases endorphins. Smiling makes you more attractive. Smiling strengthens your immune system. Smiling makes you more approachable. Smiling makes you more comfortable. Smiling makes you a better leader. Smiling lowers your heart rate, and smiling reduces pain. It's serious. It's true. Smiling is good for you. A happy heart, the Bible says, and we can go to the next verse Happy face means a glad heart. A sad face means a breaking heart. The Greek word for this is a tharseo. And tharseo in Greek in the New Testament means of good cheer or be of comfort. Now this in the New Testament, the tharseo was used seven times by Jesus. And seven times he used it specifically in a time of tragedy or of sickness. He came into a situation, and the way he used this was be of good cheer or be of comfort in a trying situation. Now, I'm going to go through this, but I was trying to think of some things for me 
Now, you guys are different, obviously, than what I... But what makes me happy? That's what I, that's what I was thinking about. What does make... And so I, I brought some items here that make me happy. These things I find joy in. When I look at them or when I see them, I, I, I smile. I have good feelings about them. Now, this is not in any order of top to last, okay? But this is what... I find cheers me up. Anybody, Leo? Rugby ball. I love rugby. I played it for too long. My wife would say too long, too many concussions, too many broken bones. I love rugby. Anytime it's on TV, I stop, I sit down, nothing else goes on. This morning, uh, before I came to church, Flicked on the TV, and there was Australia playing New Zealand. And, and I had to leave before it was over. I don't even know who won. Leo? No? Unbelievable. Um, but I love rugby. I played over in Europe. I played in England and in France. I, I, whenever I see this, whenever I watch the game, I always tell Jennifer, I think I can still play. 55 years old. You know, I think I can still... I went, I took my son to a rugby game watching it on the sidelines and I was going, you know, I think I can do this. And of course, she says, I dare you. I dare you. There's no more rugby for me. This brings me happiness. Just seeing this, I get happy. I put, it puts a smile on my face. Mexico. Mexico makes me happy. I've been there... I don't know, 16 or 18 times, 50. I'm not sure how many times. I, and, and I'm not talking about resorts either. The, the places in Mexico that cheer me up are these little villages up in the mountains. Uh, I went, uh, the very first time I ever went to an, a resort was in Puerto Vallarta. And we rented uh, horses and we um, rode horses up into the mountains three hours, up into a little village up on top of a mountain. And I finally was at home. Um, everything about Mexico brings comfort to me. The smell of Mexico, the, the corn tortillas of Mexico, um, dogs wandering the streets aimlessly, uh, a little child, 13, 10, 12, 13 years old, herding goats down the street, brings me back to Mexico. I love everything about it. I love the, the, the chaos of Mexico. It's, it's weird, but it's just some of the stuff in Mexico is just like, whew, I'm, I'm at home now. I'm where I'm supposed to be. And I don't know if you know this, but when, uh, when I graduated from Regent College, um, uh, my wife and I were going to sell everything and actually had the house on the market, I think, and, and we were looking at vans. We were going to sell everything and move to Mexico, take our kids, put them in a trailer, and just go to Mexico. And God had other plans for me. This was a number of years ago, obviously, that, that God had that, um, told me not to go to Mexico. Um, another thing, I know Quentin will enjoy this, but the Seahawks jersey. I love Seahawks. So whenever I see the Seahawks plan, it brings good memories. I don't know what that is to you, what gets you excited or, or happy. An another one is this. Now, um, you're wondering why I brought out a Dairy Queen glass. Um, my dad owned a Dairy Queen when I was young, and as I was being raised, I, this is where I would work, at Dairy Queen. And uh, always the Dairy Queen symbol al always reminded me of a smile. And whenever we would travel, come into a small town, you could guarantee one thing, that there was always a Dairy Queen in that little town. No matter how small it was, there was a Dairy Queen. And we would always stop and get an ice cream cone. And, uh, and so when I was out in Fort Langley at a, um, uh, one of those antique shops, there was two of these glasses. And I bought one for myself and one for my dad because it reminded me of, of my childhood. Weird, I know, but it does. Another thing that, um, uh, that I find gives me comfort and cheer is this little guy, Mickey Mouse. Now, Mickey um, uh, 
I love this place because of the happy music. And Alicia actually has ringtones on her phone that um, as you enter into uh, Disneyland, you swipe your card or something, and the swiping sound makes this, this musical noise. Alicia has that on her phone. You do too? Like, so everything about this brings, I, I was able to go, I think, last year to Disneyland after I got back from um, Mexico um, uh, in Tezuyuka. Uh, I stopped there with and met up with Jordan and Stephanie, my son and daughter-in-law. And uh, it was the first time she was at Disneyland. And I was able to see Disney through her eyes. And I know that this is different than, than what you guys, what, what brings joy to you? Besides the Pittsburgh Steelers jersey. Coffee? <laughs> a Starbucks sign? Yeah. What else? Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> Come on, talk to me. What brings joy? Like, my grandson brings me joy. Grandkids. I, I love seeing my grandson. I, I love looking at him. Even when my wife holds him and... I just look at them, and I, that brings me joy. My wife brings me joy when I look at my wife, when I see her. It just it makes me smile. Every time I look at her, it makes me smile. Hearing her voice is weird, but hearing her voice makes me smile, brings joy to me. What else? Christmas season, yeah. <laughs> yes, you crazy people. Anything else? Christmas yeah. Anything? Teaching? Who said that? Really? Oh, you're weird. No. It gives you life, though, right? You like it, yeah. Screaming kids. No. <laughs> but that, I mean, some of these things, but you know, it's, it's interesting that be of good cheer, be of comfort, appears in the New Testament seven times, Tharseo. Seven times, and in those seven times that Jesus was saying, be of good cheer, was always at times when somebody was going through a struggle. Now, in Matthew 9, a man was stricken with palsy, was brought to Jesus. The Lord recognized their faith and said to the man, son, be of good cheer. Now, here's this dying man. Jesus comes into the picture, and the first thing he says is, be of good cheer, or cheer up. Or, or lighten up. I'm here now. Uh, there was a Matthew, um, sorry, Matthew 9 again. There was a, a woman with a blood disease, and G Jesus said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Cheer up. Thy faith has made thee whole. The storm was raging on the Sea of Galilee in Matthew 14. The disciples with them were in a panic. Then they saw Jesus walking toward them on the water. First they thought they were seeing a ghost, but then he spoke... Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And in John 16, I won't go through all seven of them, but in John 16, Jesus explains to his disciples just how many things they will face as they go on to the call of God. You will be scattered, and I will stand along, he was telling them. Expect tribulation, for you are not of this world. But then Jesus added, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And it's interesting to note that when Jesus said this, that was the last thing he said to the disciples before he was crucified. Here Jesus comes into the picture in this situation that's tragic, this thing that he knows that he's going to be crucified, that he's going to be whipped, that the crown of thorns will be on his head, and he's telling his disciples, you're going to go through tribulation, but then in the next minute he says, oh, lighten up, be of good cheer, be happy about it. You know, I was, I, I was um, thinking about some of the things that I've experienced in my life. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a grandma phone me, and she said, uh, Kevin, um, my grandson, her only uh, grandson from this daughter, uh, my, my grandson is dying. He's two months old, and he has this rare disease. It's called SMA1. It's a spinal muscular disease. And it's a death sentence. And he has no hope to live unless God steps in. And she says, Kevin, she says, my, son, my grandson is dying. And at around four months or six months old, 
four months from that time, she says, my son will be dead. And she says, I don't know what to do. The last thing I was going to say was, hey, you should cheer up. But see, that's what Jesus said. In all of these situations, these seven times in Scripture, Jesus encounters this difficulty, the sick woman, this, this man that is dying, all of these things that happen to Jesus. In every situation, he comes into it and says, cheer up. I was, I was by um, some, some people, I've experienced some things in my life that that would be the last thing I would say is cheer up. But Luke 6, 38, but you have to understand that the gospel is countercultural. It's different. They say something, and it's supposed to be something different. So I'll give you some examples. Luke 6, 38, it says, Give, and it will be given to you. Well, right there is countercultural. Because what, we're, what, what the world is saying, keep, and then hoard, don't give it away. But Jesus is saying, give, and it will be given to you. So we look, be of good cheer, be of comfort, countercultural, do something good. Given it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The scripture goes against everything that we know in society. What God's saying here, give what you need and get what you want. So if I want, for instance, my wife is in the nursery right now, but I used her as an example. If I want my wife to love me, I love her first. If I give to my wife, she automatically gives back to me. And in some marriages and some husbands sit there and they want to take, 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 take. You give to me. I'm the man. You do what I say. But the Bible is saying that for the man, you give to your wife, you love her, you care for her, you pour into her life, and in response to that, she automatically wants to give back to you. Something different that's in the world, you give what you need to get what you want in a right way, in a righteous way. I want my wife to love me, I love her first. I, I want these things to happen in my life, then I have to do that first. Completely counter cultural. If you need love, give love. If you need a blessing, give a blessing. If you're struggling financially, tithe. Doesn't make sense. What do you mean if I'm struggling financially, tithe? Well, the Bible says that you would be given, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And it's the only scripture in, in, the, in, in the Bible that it says that you, Jesus is saying, and God's saying, test me on this one. I'm going to prove to you that if you give me I'm going to give you in return. It doesn't make sense. The Bible says that God's discipline makes you happy. The world disagrees. The Bible says that children make you happy. The world says that they are a burden to be exterminated at will. The Bible says enjoying the labor of our hands makes you happy. The world says enjoying the labors of another's hand is happiness. The Bible says that happy is the people who's in God's will. The Lord says, happy will he be if he's eliminated from society. The Bible says, happy is the man that gets wisdom, reading the word of God, praying. The world says, happy is the man that perpetually entertained, sitting there just receiving. Happy he who has mercy on the poor. Happy is he who keeps the word and does it. Happy is he who endures. Happy is he who suffers for the sake of Righteousness, happy is he who testifies of God's good, goodness. That's true happiness. See, it's different than what we think. We think if we want something, we need to just hoard it and keep it to ourselves. But the Bible is saying something different. See, how do we get, how do we be cheerful? How do we be happy? How do we do those things in our lives? Jesus spoke these things at our joy might be full. Our good cheer is rooted in the truth of God's word, not in the feeling or the circumstances. Now, I want to, you know, I've heard, I've been a, a Christian. Um, my dad was a pastor when I was, uh, when I was born, so I've been raised in the church. That's why it's funny when I say Sister Lottie. Some people don't understand that. That's, that was my tradition. Everybody that's in the church, it's like union workers. 
You ever go to a union meeting? Yes, brother this. Yes, sister that. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting that I was raised in a church that everybody in the, the church was family, so we would call them Sister Janice, you know, Brother um, Danny, uh, or Sister, what's your name again? Just kidding. We're raised in the church where we say those things and always brought a, a happiness or a, a, a smile to my face and stuff. But how do we do this? How do we take um, this, this story about how to be happy? How do we make it happen in our lives? Too many times I've, I've heard preaching that, that it tells you what you should do but doesn't tell you how to do it, if you know what I'm saying. So I'm going to give you 11 things to practice acting cheerfully. And if you stick with it, eventually they, you will become a cheerful person. So you ready? How do we do this? Got your pens and pencils out? You do? Good job. Number one, smile on purpose. Even when things are tough, or especially when things are tough, smile. Because we talked about the smile and and, and the he healing that comes out of smiling, and the warmth that comes out of smiling. So number one, smile on purpose. Number two, this one I struggle with sometimes, hold your tongue. When you feel the urge to complain, bite your tongue, and literally, if you need to. If you want to criticize something or someone else, refrain. Staying silent is a wonderful way to get through this stressful moment. Without saying or doing something, we, you will regret later. My, my mom, um, my mother-in-law always says, you will be held accountable for every word that proceeds out of your mouth. Or my, my mom said, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. And that's sort of the, what I'm saying here. Be positive. Sometimes saying what you feel, saying what you think you need to say is not what you need to do. Just be silent. Smile and be silent. Anybody relate to that? Or is it just me? Josh, thank you. Number three, change your brain each morning. Now, our brains are naturally wired to focus on the negative throughout the day. But commit to being positive every morning. Now, I do this every, every night. I go to bed. I'm, I'm usually up at 5 in the morning. I'm usually at work at 6.30. So what I do is, is I'm in bed by 9, 9.30 at the latest, sometimes 9.15. I can't survive the next day unless I'm in bed really, er, really early. But sometimes what will what I'll happen is I'll wake up in the middle of the night. I have to use the bathroom or something. There's a bump in the night and I wake up, 2.30, 3 o'clock, and then I start thinking. Start thinking about problems. I start thinking about this person. I'm, I start thinking about the emails that I get when I wake up in the morning, turn my phone on, and I got 25 emails. And, and I, I'm thinking about the job that I have to go to up in the hill in the SFU. And I'm thinking about this job out. And I'm thinking about my job out in Calgary. I'm thinking about all of these things and all of these worries. And my brain is going crazy. And I'm thinking about all the problems. Change your brain each morning. Commit to being positive every morning. I'm going to get up. I'm going to be positive. I'm going to think good thoughts. That's number three. Number four, focus on creation. We feel cheerful when we're creating something good. Shift your focus from overcoming a problem to creating a solution. See, we always think about the problems that we have to deal with. But what we have to do is think about creating a solution or creating a memory, creating a new us. Go into it, wanting to be better, wanting, how am I going to do this? I, I, I hope you're getting some of these points because this was really helpful to me. When we focus on creation or creating a new me or a new you, we start moving from dealing with the difficult things of our land, just worrying about and solving problems, in creating something new in our lives where all we're doing is looking for solutions. There's a difference in our mindset. Number five, admit the truth. Acting cheerfully doesn't mean we ignore our true feelings. It simply means we don't want our feelings to control how we are in the world. 
And in fact, ignoring our true feelings can destroy cheerfulness. It's important to check in with ourselves, to feel and grieve and process what's really going on in our lives, but not live there. That's the key. See, sometimes in our lives we go through a struggle, a struggle and a difficulty, and that becomes who our identity is. That becomes who we are. Who is Kevin? Well, Kevin is this. He's, every time I talk to him, it's his problem. Every time I, I, I speak to him, he's talking about uh, how, how difficult his children are and, uh, and how he's having difficulties. I'm creating that negative thing people think of me. What I want to do is move away from that into creating a solution or a, a solving the problem. Amen? Number six. Focus on making memories. When you're creating a memory, it's hard to want to be anything but cheerful. Memories are all we take us through life. They, they matter the most. Now, what does that mean, making a memory? What does it mean? Yeah, you, you go through, even our, our struggles that we go through and our difficulties bring back memories. Like, I remember one time I was really sick in Mexico, and, uh, and, and uh, I just didn't think I was going to get through that night because I was in the bathroom, in bed, I was sweating, I was fading away, and such. Those kind of things are negative, right? But though, I was making a memory out of those things. Even at Leo, you can, it, yeah, Leo was there. Um, as we go through sometimes in our difficult things that happen in our lives, we always focus on the negative, but we focus on, we're creating a memory. I remember the one time I was in Mexico, I was really sick, created a memory. Negative, no, it's a positive. Why? Because you overcame that. You're making a memory, making something new out of something that was bad. Number seven, take a time out. Just like kids need a break once in a while to regroup, so do we as adults. When cheerfulness feels like an impossibility, put yourself in a quiet place where you can breathe, lie down for a while, or just calm down. Take a time out. Give yourself five to ten seconds. Take yourself out of the situation, breathe, refocus, and then come in and encounter. But you sometimes need to have a break. Number eight, practice gratitude. Gratitude is at the heart of cheerfulness. For when you are conscious of your gifts and blessings, it's hard not to feel cheerful about them. Number nine, practice patience. Like gratitude, patience and cheerfulness go hand in hand. Cheerfulness helps you practice patience, and practicing patience leads to greater cheerfulness. Number 10, get in the now, pray, ponder, meditate, and breathe. Take 5 to 30 minutes each day. This is different than taking a timeout. Slow down, breathe deeply, pray, meditate, read the Bible, and simply ponder on the goodness of life. Take 30 minutes and get in contact with God. Read the Bible. Sit there and, and think. What I do is, is, because I'm up so early, I, have, I, I usually get up, I go and I turn the coffee pot on. When the coffee's ready, I grab my cup of coffee. Jennifer will come out. We'll sit there for a half an hour together. We'll talk. And we'll watch a, a new show, and then it's usually at 6 o'clock, I'm out the door. And it's our time. But during the day, because it's busy, I'll just turn the radio off, and I'll drive, and I'll pray, and I'll meditate. I'll think about the Lord. I'll think about my day. I'll think about those things. I'll think about those, those, those um, times with the Lord. I'll just get refreshed. I'll take 5 to 30 minutes and just focus on what God has for me. Amen? Number 11, let go. Let go. One of the biggest barriers to cheerfulness is holding on to the past. Worrying about the future and letting negativity rule your mind. I know it's not easy as it sounds, but you must let go. This is one of the more difficult things. I remember, I, I not remember, I, I've talked with people who are still dealing with things now in their lives, things that they've gone through that they had that went on in their lives as a child. 
different issues that they've had through. And sometimes, you know what, we need to have help. We need to go see a pastor. Sometimes we need to go see a counselor. Sometimes we need to go see a therapist. Sometimes we need to do all of those things. But we need to somehow get to a point of letting go. See, that, that my, my body, um, I, I, I always think of it as, as a tree. And those roots that go into me go down into the ground. But sometimes those roots aren't, aren't healthy. And what happens is it's producing negative fruit. And so as I'm standing there, as I'm growing, and, and, and this negative fruit is out there. And so what happens is sometimes we're trying to deal with the fruit. We're trying to deal with the, 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 the negative apple, the, the orange that's bad, this, this thing that's produced out of me. Instead of dealing with the bitternesses and the roots that are inside of me, those things that, that I'm holding on to sometimes. Sometimes God needs you to deal with those things, move on from those things. And it's not easy. And it's not, I, I, I want to tell you this is, this, is, this is sometimes will take years. And sometimes we'll go to heaven with them. And it's a daily occurrence of giving it over to God. But somehow we have to get to a point to allow God's cheerfulness to come into our lives. And we need to allow God to take over whatever those things are in our lives, those, those, those difficulties, those things that we're trying to overcome. But we need to let go. But what I want in closing is I, I just don't want this to be a pep talk. I don't want it to be something that, you know, those are some, some good things. But in closing, I want to read 1 Corinthians 4, 16 and 18. And it's um, the, from the message. I just liked how Eugene Peterson um, wrote this. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us. On the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by with us without His unfolding grace. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the good times, the lavish celebrations prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today and gone tomorrow. But the things we can't see now will last forever. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we have the privilege, Lord Jesus, to come into your house. And Lord, I, I ask that as we have created a memory, hopefully this morning as the memory of cheerfulness, Lord, that we can bring joy into our lives, learn to smile again, learn to appreciate those little things in our lives like what I have brought here, those teeny little things that don't matter to anybody, that they matters to me, oh God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that as we go through our lives and even go through the struggles and the trials in our lives, oh God, that you are there with us every step of the way, oh God. And Lord, that tharseo, that word, that cheer up, be of comfort, Lord, no matter what happens and what we're going through, I just ask that that be a ringing symbol in our ears, O oh God, that you are there for us, that you are there in amongst us, O oh God, that you are there in the times when we need to be cheered up, O oh God. And I thank you for it. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I spoke to maybe a few people here this morning. And Lord, if that's, that's, that's them here, Lord Jesus, I pray a special blessing. I pray that you just work on their lives. Allow us to find joy throughout this week. In the name of Jesus, with every eye closed, we do it every morning or every service. We just ask if there's anybody here that does not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if that's you, if you have not experienced salvation in your heart, just raise your hand. I would love to pray for you. Amen, amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for what you've done. And I just ask that you just give us journey's mercies. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand, please.